all my beautiful Cinnabar moths or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Welcome back to another episode of the Writer's Triangle. I'm so happy you're joining us today. And today we're going to be talking about book sales and genre. Does genre drive book sales? That's something that I've always found to be really interesting because there is just literally an avalanche of information on that says yes all signs point to yes that genre absolutely drives book sales and i don't know based on looking at at our books and the way that they sell we've to date so far because we're coming up on the one year anniversary of our first book which i'm super stoked about um not my ruckus. I almost said the wrong book title. What a horrible publisher I am. <laughs> Lucky for me, it's Chad's book and Chad will forgive me. It is not my ruckus is coming up on its one year anniversary next month, which is really exciting. And that book is literary fiction. So here's what they say about literary fiction. That literary fiction is a slow burn that you're not going to sell a lot of books, that it's going to take years and years to sell any books at all, and it really takes three or four years for a literary fiction book to catch momentum. Here's also what they say. Literary fiction is hot, red hot, and it is flying off the shelves. Okay, interesting. Which one's correct? Which source do I believe? Do I believe that literary fiction is flying off the shelves or that it's a slow burn? And here's what I think. I think that it's both. And I think that it's like with everything else. It depends on if your book gets noticed. And there are book trends that make books a little bit hotter but make books hotter in a different way. So we don't do Kindle distribution exclusively, but if you're self-publishing, KDP exclusive might be the way to go because if your book is on trend, whatever is trending in Kindle Unlimited or whatever is trending in Kindle sales and your book is in that genre, then Kindle will push your book more but only if you're doing Kindle Direct Publishing exclusive. And we don't, so we don't benefit from that. The same thing with Amazon. If you're going through Amazon and you're letting Amazon print your books and you're selling your books exclusively through Amazon and your book is on trend, Amazon will push your sales. We don't distribute exclusively through Amazon because we love libraries. We absolutely love libraries and we love our authors and we love ourselves. So I'm not saying that if you publish with Amazon exclusively, you don't love yourself. But I'm saying if you're a publishing house that's doing it, Amazon just, it takes money from you. It takes money from the author and it takes money from the bookstores that it sells to. And so for us, we were thinking about, okay, so it's going to take money from the independent bookstores that it delivers to. And I don't really like that. It's going to take money from me beyond publishing costs. It's going to take a percentage of sales. And I don't really like that. And it's going to take a percentage from our authors. And I really don't like that. So <laughs> it's, we're not making millions on books. We don't make a lot of money on books and on each individual cell, there's not like a huge pie to, to split up despite what you see because you have to factor in cost of covering, uh, cost of covering, editing, printing, all of that goes into the cost of the book and it, it really chips away at the, the profit for a book rather quickly. So if you're looking at trends, to be able to write a book on trend, you have to be fast. And I find that our authors are not fast writers. Some of our authors really turn them out quickly. 
um, they can turn out a novel in six to nine months, and that's lightning fast. There are some authors who can turn out a novel every 30 days, and that is amazing. And that is romance. If you're a strictly romance writer and you're going through Kindle, it's a book a month. Romance readers read sometimes two to three books a day. And I was just like, wow, that is a voracious appetite. And erotica is the same way. You have to really be able to turn them out. So we don't really do romance and strict romance uh, in that Harlequin romance kind of way. And we don't do erotica. And it's not because I have anything against erotica. It's because I don't feel like I can compete in the market, in the marketplace for erotica. Because when you're looking at every 30 days having to have a new book by an author... I was just like, that's a lot to ask of an author. And that really, you're asking your author, you're asking the author to dedicate all of their time to that. And I don't, I have this weird tick where I don't like to ask our authors to dedicate all of their creative time to any one project. I like our authors to be able to work on more than one project at a time. And that was part of what inspired doing the e-zine was that it gives our authors somewhere to submit to. But a lot of our authors submit short stories, not just to us, but other places, because we can only take five stories plus our, our writer in uh, residence stories. So we only do six stories an issue. And that's just not enough. So I encourage our authors to get to know other publishers and get to know other zines and submit to anthologies, you know, submit their short stories to anthologies and that sort of thing. Because it, in my mind, it allows them balance and freedom, right? Because you can be working on your novel and you can have your word count and your page count, but that's a grind, Working on writing a novel is a grind from my perspective. And I feel like I don't want my, I just don't like the the idea of our authors just grinding it out and having to get us something in 30 days. And I feel like if I were going to do erotica or romance, I would have to be that way. I would have to say, hey guys, we need to put something out every 30 days. And that's just the way it has to be. And I don't want to be that kind of taskmaster. I also don't like to publish more than one novel from an author in a year. So that takes romance and erotica off the table for us as well. And I don't do faith-based. Um, and the reason that we don't do faith-based is because I don't want to proselytize or promote any one faith above the other. So that would mean doing faith and going out and scouring the earth for <laughs> faith books from every known religion that that I could think of for me to feel fair and balanced and for me to feel like I wasn't proselytizing or promoting a lifestyle. And faith-based, I don't understand the faith-based market. When I look at it, it says that faith-based is really hot and trending, but I'm not seeing a lot of bestsellers in the faith, in the faith-based genre. There are bestsellers in that genre, but I'm not seeing a lot of them turn over quickly. I'm seeing more like slow burn in terms of that genre for me and my research. And I could be totally wrong. And I, I have, Like I said, I just know enough to know what I don't know. (laughs) I don't know everything. And so looking at the the genres, I feel like erotica needs to be published every month. I feel like romance needs to be published every month. And that's romance that's softcore erotica. Um, And if there's not enough softcore erotica in the romance, it's not going to sell as a romance book. 
has been my experience and is what the research says. We sell books that have romance in them, but are not romance books, if that makes sense. And we get a lot of feedback that people want more romance than the romance we're giving them. And that's kind of like, uh, but it's not a romance book. And to have the romance be centered in the book wouldn't be a good fit for the book. And the books that the romance is centered, we do have some steaminess, but that's not quite what the book is is about it's not just about that and that's because i don't think i could do a service and again i think it has to be monthly and i think that impacts sales if you don't have a quick follow-up i think romance readers aren't willing to wait a year for a book too whereas if you're telling if you're doing like a contemporary fiction that has romance elements i feel like people are waiting a year are willing to wait a year for a book too if it's a sequel but I could be wrong. So that covers romance and erotica. A lot of people say that there's favoritism in the book industry for YA science, for young adult science fiction. And I find that that's usually people who write adult science fiction saying that there's favoritism for young adult science fiction. And I wouldn't know because we haven't published any, so I don't have any firsthand experience but when I look at young adult science fiction I don't see it outselling adult science fiction in the way that people are reporting and these are authors who are reporting not being able to get an agent or not being able to sell their books these are people that we know that are talking to us in the industry and saying yo they're just not buying any adult science fiction and I don't know if that's down to marketing because I read a lot of adult science fiction. I also read, for just enjoyment, read a lot of middle grade and uh, young adult science fiction. So I read across the age spectrum. I really like middle grade because I know it's going to be a light, easy one day read with nothing too heavy and no trauma. <laughs> some, and some days I just don't want to be traumatized. I just want something light and airy. And so that brings us to middle grade. And that's why we picked up Relatively Normal Secrets. I jumped on it when it came in our inbox because we didn't have any books that were trauma free on our in our lineup at all. Everything has trauma in it. And I was just like, Okay, because even our romantic comedy slash cozy mystery has some trauma in it in that the one of the main characters is neurodivergent. It's a funny book. It's a light one day read, but it is talking about the lived experience of being neurodivergent. And it also does cover there's a bisexual character and it also does cover bigotry and bias against bisexuality. So for me... It doesn't quite tick all the boxes for that trauma-free, I'm just going to be safe. There's nothing going to be triggering whatsoever in this book at all. And looking at our YA book, Drumfingil, it definitely has a lot of, of trauma in it. And you start off the beginning of the book, meeting Marcus, who's disabled, which I absolutely love, a black main character who's middle class and disabled, love it, but it's not the lightest affair. And there is lightness and fun, but there's also a little bit of sadness and trauma that runs through the book. And Pixies in the Mist is our adult uh, portal fantasy, and it is traumatic. It has tons of content notes. So I was wanting a book that had zero content notes. To me, that's a good middle grade book. When you don't have to put a single content note in it, you can read it in a day and there's something clever and fun about it. And I think those types of middle grade books sell really well. I feel like with middle grade, it's either you're completely capturing the experience 
of being in middle grade and it'll sell really well or you're really capturing the excitement and adventure of being a middle grader and that innocence and charm but also keeping it funny and witty where it ages up and down really well and I think those types of middle grade books sell really well. So for me when it comes to genre when we're looking at middle grade I think it's more of rather than the genre I think it's about meeting the expectations of the genre and that is for me personally and again this is just me that's no content notes I want zero content notes in my middle grade books I don't want any trauma I don't want any swear words except maybe like damn is okay but anything more than damn is too much for me in middle grade and that's my preference and that's my thinking and I think those types of books do really well and I also think that middle grade if it's a series does really well I think that series are very popular and I think that if you can get you know get in the Library of Congress and if you can get those librarians to stock middle grade I think libraries make or break middle grade cells and I also think teachers make or break middle grade cells and that's why it has to age up and down really well because I think teachers have to enjoy the book to put it on their students reading list and feel that the book has merit and that the book offers something to their students if they read it so those are kind of how I think about selling middle grade. And so I do think that if you say middle grade and then you put a lot of trauma and a lot of cursing, that it's not going to play as well. So I think there are some rules for, for middle grade. I, and I've seen books that have broken the rules and have done great. I just don't have that kind of courage yet when it comes to middle grade. I like to play it safe. With YA, young adult, I think that there's no specific genre in young adult that does better than any other type of genre in young adult, at least in my experience. Um, I like portal fantasies. And so we have, in 2021, we put out three portal fantasies because I love portal fantasies. And so does everybody else and they're all really good books and all really fun portal fantasies i think that when you do a portal fantasy for it to to do well i think that it has to be different than than the than the world we're in now right there has to be thought about that and i'm going to do a whole podcast on portal fantasies because i absolutely love them so for me, I feel like what impact sells more than a specific genre is a specific marking. So I don't think that science fiction or outside of, of course, erotica and romance, I don't think that like science fiction, literary fiction, um, contemporary fiction, gothic fiction, horror I don't think any one genre sells more than the other unless you're, you know, following a trend and you can turn a book out in 30 days because that's how fast being on trend has to be. You have to be able to get that book out in 30 days from what I've observed. And I know a lot of indie authors that do that and do really, really well getting their book out on trend. And they share, they have shared with me, I'm lucky enough that they are willing to share openly with me about their process. And I love that collaboration. And they share with me that they just have to do that for the first book. And then they have six months to write the follow up. So if you're following a trend, they say, I want book one has to be written in 30 days. And then I've got six months to get book two out. And then every six months, I have to get a book out if I caught a trend and I'm riding a wave, I want to make sure that my book can ride that wave all the way through. And what I'm hoping to do is to create trends and create waves, but do a slower build where people are, are willing to wait a year for a book 
to allow each book to gain momentum, to gain popularity, but also to make room for other authors in our roster to have their time to shine too. And I want more authors because I want more diversity. And I think that if I was putting a book out every six months, every six months by the same author, for us as a press, I just don't see that working as a business model and what we want to do with the press. So looking at what sells books and what determines whether or not your book will sell. And what I've found with the feedback that we get from our reviewers is that if we say a book is young adult, then it needs to be young adult and not middle grade and not adult. And we have to really understand what young adult means. And I find that that young adult is if the characters are in their early teens or mid teens, mid teens is a little bit late. So basically like freshman or sophomore, sophomore years in high school, you can kind of get away with the junior years in high school, but that's getting at the higher of the age scale. No sexual content. And, but there can be violence. And so I find that that young adult is you can have violence. You can have a relationship, but the, there needs to be no explicit sex or implied intercourse in the book. And those are the, the rules in that the writing has to be accessible at the level of a young adult reader at that, that age range. And that age range, you're looking at the 14, 15 year olds through adulthood is basically YA, at least my understanding. So if you're going to write a YA book, make sure that you make it exciting. Make sure that it can read up. They don't really read down because they usually have some sort of violence or trauma in them that prevent them from reading down. And then there's other, our YA books at least have that. Other YA books don't have that trauma. And so they can read as a middle grade or a young adult. And most YA books kind of, blur that line between YA and middle grade um, based on how adult the content and how mature the writing is and how mature the characters are and what goes on in it. Middle grade, like I said, no content notes, light, easy reading really captures that, you know, third to eighth grade experience and that's middle grade. And then children's books we don't handle children's books but children's books can have trauma that's not traumatizing and i think of a series that people either love or hate and that series of unfortunate events it's written in a really whimsical tongue-in-cheek way but it does have the trauma of them being orphans and if you read the book it's really dark but young readers don't get the darkness of it like Count Olaf wanting to marry a baby, they don't get the darkness of that and how twisted and messed up that is, but the adults do. And I think that's what I'm talking about with the aging up and down is a really great example. Um, so I guess that's more middle grade than children's. I think a great children's series is uh, the Magic School Bus, and that's a science series. Lots of really great information. And I also think the Magic Treehouse is great. Not everyone likes the Magic Treehouse because the science, I mean, the science, the history isn't exactly on point. So you can kind of be, I think, a little bit shady with the research, a little bit shaky rather with the research when you're writing for younger audience. And then there's uh, picture books and we know what a picture book is, right? You just have a few sentences on each page. And as you turn it, there's a picture on every page. That's a picture book. So the difference between a picture book and a, a middle grade and a children's book, I find children's book, they have a picture every, mm, I want to say 10 to 15 pages. And it's an illustration of something that's going on in the book. And that sort of helps the reader transition from 
picture book to chapter book. And that's where we kind of, for me, that's my understanding of children's chapter books. And I think that if you follow the conventions and you follow the rules of these things, that you have a better chance of selling in those younger genres. And that's YA on down. So looking at adult genre, when it comes to adult, it has to be tightly written, really well edited, and an engaging story that captivates the reader. And I think with adults that you have about one page to do something that captures the reader's interest for it to be for it not to be a book they don't finish. I think they'll start with one page and I think they might, from my experience with readers who who explain that it's, I'm not reading this anymore, um, they'll give a book up to three chapters. But usually by the first page, they have a pretty good idea of whether or not they're going to finish an adult book or any book when it comes to adult readers. And if that first page doesn't captivate them, it kind of taints the way or clouds the way that they're looking at the rest of the chapters and makes you really have to redeem yourself if you don't have a good first page kind of thing. And giving it up to chapter three is sort of like the rule of thumb to say, I gave this book a fair chance. Making sure that those first three chapters and the entire book has consistency is going to help the book sell if it's in an adult genre. Adults really pay attention to consistency. And when I'm talking about consistency, I'm talking about consistency in dialogue, consistency in pacing, and in character behavior, and in the world that they're in. If something happens that doesn't quite fit in the world, then that's going to be a turnoff to readers and if in the first three chapters there's an info dump that's going to turn readers off and I think that has more to do with what people enjoy reading versus a genre rule so info dumps are a big no-no and show not tell I think is something that I'm going to dedicate an entire podcast to because it's something that a lot of writers struggle with at least that I'm seeing, and I'm also going to be dedicating a podcast to, to world building, and that'll probably be in my portal fantasy. I'll probably be focusing a lot on world building, and that can translate to any genre, and that's what I find when we look at genre outside of, like, what age group we're going for, um, and whether it's contemporary, gothic, horror, science fiction, all of it boils down to are you meeting the reader's expectations? Are you going completely against convention because you know convention? Did you write a book that you enjoy? Did you write a book that you would recommend to a friend? Do you know who your intended readers are? So after you're done writing your book, who in your life would you recommend your book to? And if there's no one in your personal life that you would recommend your book to, who do you know that exists in the world that you would recommend your book to? And it can't be everyone. And that's the hard part. And as a marketer, I want to say, this book is great for everyone. But that's not the case. Every book is not great for everyone. And over this the year of being in the press and, and doing marketing, it's really come home solidly for me because of the amount of reviews that I've consumed. What book is for who? And really thinking about when I'm marketing the book, who is this book intended for? Because that impacts how I interpret feedback and how I interpret All of the data that comes in, how I interpret book sales and are we marketing this book correctly? Is it going to where it needs to go? And is it being, is it reaching the population that it needs to reach? So I don't think that genre in terms of science fiction, horror, or any of that affects 
sales as much as knowing what age group your book is intended for in terms of what is the bulk of your readership going to be. Or I don't even know if the bulk of the readership is right. What's the age group of your intended audience? Because I love a great middle grade book. And I'm in my 50s. So I'm not the target demographic. But would I feel comfortable handing this book to an eight-year-old and letting them read it? If not, it's probably not middle grade. And I know eight is, everyone's like, mm, people debate what's the age range for, for middle grade. And I feel like eight, I feel like grade three is where it's at when it comes to middle grade, that that's where it starts. Because that's when the young readers are transitioning, right, from and getting into chapter books. And so I think mm, eight, nine is where it starts. So like I say with everything, these are just my opinions. And this is just based on my research. Go out there, do your own research and see what you find. And then let me know. What did I get right? What did I get wrong? You can let me know if you're listening to this on YouTube. Let me know in the comments what you think. Be nice. Or you can leave us a comment on Twitter or on any of our social medias. You can leave us a comment on Instagram or Facebook. And yeah, let me know what you think. Do you agree with me? Do you disagree? And as always, thank you for listening. I love all of our beautiful Cinnabar moths or any kind of moth you want to be. And like I say every week, you can even be a butterfly, but I'm not Mariah Carey and I'm not trying to bite her rhyme. And I'll talk to you in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.